How's it going everyone? My name is Stephen French, aka Abrexis, and this is my fourth time trying to make this video. Yeah! So welcome to part one of my Let's Clone Programming tutorial series. This series will be designed to teach new programmers how to get into game development, or even just starting programmers how to get into game development. And we're going to focus on covering and replicating classic titles, ranging from arcade games to mobile games to console games, probably going up to about Super Nintendo, I would imagine. So if you don't know anything about Game Maker or about programming, please go back to my last video. That'll get you started on how to find Game Maker and point you in the right direction. If you have Game Maker installed, whether or not you do know programming, just follow along with the steps and I should be able to guide you through this. If you get stuck at all, if you have any questions, any errors that you can't explain, comment down in the description and I'll do my best to try to fix those. So yeah, let's get started. So now that we have Game Maker up and running, Let's go to new and we're going to name the project whatever we want this part doesn't matter i'm just going to call it space invaders oh man because i'm not original but to start off we need to make a room for the game so you can either do that by clicking up here to create a room or you can come down to room i don't know why i'm pointing right click and create a room doesn't make much of a difference so variable syntax is pretty standard across game maker or at least across the programmers who use game maker and that any variable that you make, you're going to start with a prefix that has something to do with what type it is. Because we're going to have a sprite that is drawn for a character, but then we have an object for the same character, and those names will change. Well, I'm sorry, those names will be the same, but the prefix will change. So right now we're going to make a room, so we call it rm underscore and just level. The name doesn't actually matter. The size of our room for this game is 576 by, what did I have, 480. I just played around with these numbers, this size seemed to work well for my monitor. Um, that's all we really need to touch for now, so we can go to save. Now we have a room, if we were to press play, it's going to pop up and show us just a gray room, that's all of our game for right now. So let's make the game look a little bit like Space Invaders first. Now the artwork is probably the least important part for early development, but I find it to be motivating to have the game have some type of aesthetic early on. Plus, this will introduce just how to import images anyways. So we're going to do that by just adding a background. So create a background, we're going to load. Now this file that I'm going to be using will be posted in right here, Space Invaders. This will be posted in the description. I'll probably, prob I'll probably link it to Dropbox or Google Drive. So you'll have access to all of the sprites that I've made, or all the artwork that I've made. So we're coming to Backgrounds, and just going to choose this. This is the background that I found on a lot of the Space Invader games. And yeah, for some reason my width and height are super small, but who cares about that? So, same naming scheme, we have bg underscore because it's the background, and we'll just call this one background because it's not the menu screen or anything, it's just that. We're going to come down to room, click on backgrounds, no background, you can either click in this window or on this icon, and add the background. If you, oh, where is it, I don't want to tile it. Stretch, there we go. So stretch it across the screen, that's why the resolution didn't matter. And yeah, we are good to start with our game. So first we're going to make the player. So we can move around, shoot the player, shall not shoot the player, but shoot from the player. And yeah, first we need an image for that player so we know what it looks like. So we're gonna go to that same file, we're gonna load sprite, and just click on player. We're gonna grab the laser at a different point. So with that same syntax, Oops, sprite underscore player. Just keep it easy to learn. Now, the dimensions of this player are 32 by 32. We're going to change its origin, so where we place the player on the map in all the code that we use will be relative to this fixed point, which is 16 by 16. So now if we get the player's x coordinate, y coordinate, it's referring to that point on the screen. And we'll leave collision how it is. That will be something that we'll care about a little bit later. So we have our player, we're going to come down and just for now since we're here, whoa, I didn't want to edit you, we're going to load the laser that the player is going to shoot. So sprite, I don't know why I think it's a laser, but it, to me it's a laser. Sprite, laser, we're going to center that as well, and we're good. Alright, so now we have a sprite of a player, it's still not something we can use, it's not an object in our game, so we're going to come down to object, either here or I believe it's this circle. Create an object, we can call this object underscore player. This is what I meant by that naming scheme. This icon or this sprite will be in reference to this object. 
so we want it to have the same name. We're going to give it that sprite of the player, and this is kind of where we start in with a little bit of code. Now, in this window, we have our events and our actions. Events are kind of like parts of the object's life or times and events of the in the object's life. Actions are what are carried out within those events. So you're typically what you're going to start off with for most projects or most objects is you're going to want a create event. A create event is an event that runs once at the start of the object's life. So if your object is already in the room, when the room starts up, create event will run once. If you're creating the object while you're in the game, once it's created, the create event will still only run once. This is a great place to, to kind of declare some of our, ba our, our variables. Some of our variables. So the main thing that you're going to be dealing with is adding an event, coming over here, this is all drab, <laughs> drab. oh man, I can't talk, English is hard. This is all drag and drop stuff that I don't really know how to use because it doesn't matter and it just it's too cheesy and you can't really control as much in my opinion. So we're going to grab code, execute code, and drag it right down to the middle. This is where programming comes in, this is where a little bit of knowledge of other languages will help, but just following me again should get the point across. Now anything that I type is going to be in white characters. Any variables that the game is already aware of, it's going to, whoops, will come up in red letters. Any functions or methods that we can use, like a keyboard check, these will be in is that a yellowish orange. And any comments, comments are something that the code will just entirely skip. They're only for the programmer's uh, benefit of reading and know what's going on. Those will be done with three different methods, or two primarily. So a double slash, anything I type is green, meaning that's a comment. A even better is a triple slash. I'll show you what this does in a little bit. We'll do initiate variables. And last one is for a large area if you do whoops, slash star, and star slash to close it. Anything within here is going to be green. Anything after it will be white. So that's how commenting works. We can get rid of those for now. This triple slash is really useful because if you come back to this event, now I have a title for that executable code. So if I had a few different actions, I'll know which one is which. Now, that took a little bit longer than it needed to, but most this is the part one of the series. So I'm going to cover a few of the tiny things like that. So this character is going to start off with a few different variables. We're going to have hspa, or hspeed, which represents our horizontal speed. We're going to have a speed, which I guess you could call a max speed. I believe 5 was what I used. And that's, well, that's actually not it at all. Now if you're familiar with other languages, in GameMaker you don't have to typecast. I don't have to reference these as integers or floats. So this is just an integer. If I were to have given it a, a decimal place and it would register as a double or a float, whatever I need it to be pretty much. It's automatically typecast, which is nice, but not nice at the same time waste a little bit of data, but it, it's fine. It works pretty well. So next up, we're going to have a Boolean variable. Again, you don't need to typecast, and a Boolean, if you don't know, is a binary variable. It has two potential outputs, and that'll make a little more sense in a second. So I call this Boolean alive equal to true. Basically, this variable can be called at any time, and I can check whether or not it's true or false, zero or one, in some languages, yes or no. And I can just use that as a flag just to, to see what's going on and only do things when the character is alive and not when he's dead or respawning. Now next up we have lives, but lives we're not going to oops, equals three. Lives will not be used in this part of the series. It's not gonna matter quite yet, but I don't feel like coming back and forgetting and not figuring out why it's not working. So we're just gonna add that now. You can do the same and ignore it. So lives is there, it works. Next up we have respawn time. This is going to be another integer. Oops. So respawn time, we're going to set it to 30. It's just what I found to work pretty well. Just another, again, an integer value. And we'll figure out what it's doing later on. This, uh, Both of these might not be used in this part. So let's come into the next thing. We're going to be using a step event. Another side tangent is step events are bits of code. They're events that will be run every single frame, every time that the computer just keeps going through or rather every loop, every cycle, whatever you want to call it. So this will be running all the time, every frame. This is where we're going to be adjusting pretty much everything in our code. 
A step event, if you click on, you can find that there's a step, a begin step, and an end step. These are three different events that all do the same thing. It's just a begin step will always run first, and end step will always run at the end. So I just use one step, and other people might find a use for the other two more so than I do. So we're going to create a step event. We're going to come down to execute code again. We're going to give this a title. So this one will just pretty much deal with movement. Now, I, I like to comment quite a bit, especially in my step events, and it's very good practice. I still don't comment quite enough, so I encourage you to just build that habit right away if you're new to programming. So right here, we're going to look at our controls. So we're going to use two controls. We're going to use a variable, which is pretty much going to be a Boolean. We're going to call it key underscore left, meaning that it's a key that I'm pressing and left. That's just my own naming scheme. So or that's just my own naming type, rather. That's yeah, fine. So key left equals keyboard, oh damn, I already showed you this before, keyboard, ch oh my god, I hate this, keyboard check, parentheses, vk left. Now as I mentioned before, if text is red means it's a variable that GameMaker already recognizes, if it's yellow, it's a function that GameMaker provides for us. If at any time you're confused about what a function does, or what a method does, if you middle click on it, you'll be presented with GameMaker's help page, and it will explain pretty clearly what's going on. But what this means is that our key left variable, whenever the left button, the left arrow key is held down, this variable will be equal to one, and whenever it's not, it'll be a zero. It's as simple as that. But we're actually going to use this as a negative. We're gonna count this as a negative one, and you'll see why in just a second. So now we're gonna do the same thing with a key right is equal to key keyboard I can't type. Oh my god, the same mistake. Check vk underscore right. Good. I have OCD. So we have a key right that is 1 whenever right is pressed, and a key left that is negative 1 whenever left is pressed. Now we're going to create a variable. I'm actually going to typecast this one because when we call it a var, it is a local variable, meaning that this variable can only be read in this method and at the end of, or in this step. And at the end of this step, no one else can call it, so we don't have to waste data. So move is going to equal key left plus key, whoops, right, tight, key tight. Now as you can see, or as you can guess, I'm sure, move will either equal negative one if left is pressed, one if right is pressed, and a zero if either none or pressed or both are pressed. Now we're going to go into telling the object itself to move when we've done something. So tell it to move to the right. At the same time, we're going to handle collisions. So that sh might be interesting for some of you. So if, which is as English works, if if move is greater than 0, meaning that move has to be positive 1, which means right is pressed. And uh, let's see, do I need parentheses? I do not. So x plus 16. What this means is x is, as I mentioned before with the sprite, with that plus on the icon, x is now pointing to the middle of our sprite. My icon was 16 pixels wide, so x plus 16 is looking at the right edge of our object. So if x plus 16 is less than room width, yeah. So, and then we'll do curve the braces to kind of contain what happens if this statement is true. So. If move is greater than 1, so we're pressing the right button, and x plus 16 is less than room width, meaning that, sh I don't know if this is going to be reversed for you guys, so I'm sorry if it is. If the players here were pointing to the rightmost pixel, if there's a wall and that rightmost pixel over here goes past that wall at all, then we're not going to read this code because that fails our if statement. So we're going to check in only for that. That way we just can't want run out of the map. There's a hundred ways you can do this collision check. I find this one to be the easiest. So now from here, we're going to do h uh, horizontal speed is equal to speed. Easy as that. Next up, move left will do. If move is oops, less than zero and uh, x minus 16 is less than zero. Pretty much the same exact thing. But now the room width is zero because we're all the way on the left side. 
I didn't mention this, I don't know, I didn't mention this before, but a uh, the grid of how well, how a game maker sees a grid is that the top left corner is zero, and y goes down positively, and x goes across positively. So from here we have horizontal speed is equal to negative speed because we want it to be negative five so we can go left. Okay. So actually right here we can even no 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 we can't we gotta do one more thing first. So this is just changing our the variable horizontal speed, which doesn't mean anything. Game maker just thinks of that as a variable that's been updated but not applied. So we actually need to update the character's position. So we're gonna say if alive, this will be more important later on, but we'll use it for now. So if the character is alive, which is set to true and unchanged, so it'll always be true, x plus, uh, rather, our x coordinate of our character is going to equal x plus horizontal speed. We're gonna do this every frame, so every time it increments. But there's an easy way to do this in just about every language. Instead of x equals x plus something, you can just do x plus equals horizontal speed, and that's just how I will be typing it pretty much from now on. So yeah, that's all we need for now. Let's hit play. Let's go into our room, and we're going to need to actually create the object and put it in there. So grab the object, put them down wherever you'd like them to start. Hit check, hit play, and let's see it. Come on. Oh, no. What'd I do? So this debugging is actually really nice and pretty efficient that it showed us this. So it's telling me that in my object player step normal event 1, because I only have one event, Line seven, it says that variable move equals key left plus key right. Uh, right now, it says that key right, whatever, whatever, has not been set. So most likely, what I've done, uh, do I? No, it's not broken. Most likely, what I've done is I just didn't spell one of them correctly. So, line seven, key underscore didn't spell right, which I could have seen on that screen. You'll find that syntax and spelling mistakes are going to be the worst part of our program. Good. So we have a guy, he's on the screen. If I press left, nothing happens, but if I press right, he moves infinitely. How did I fuck that up? <laughs> oh, man. Oh, oh snap. I know what's going on here. So what I forgot here is I did if and then I did another if. We have to look at this a little bit different. I'm really sorry that I fucked this up. So, else if, because we don't want to be checking for left and for right. That would be pretty dumb. So we want to check if it's if he's moving right. If he's not moving right, we want to check if he's moving left. And if he's not moving either, we're just going to say else and hp equals zero. So if minus 16 is oh shit, greater than zero. Wow. I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna have those tutorials where everything's just typed wrong. Yeah, good. So now we walk left and we walk left, uh, right. Perfect. Done. Our character is uh almost finished. So we have stuff. We have movement. We also want this character to be able to shoot. So I like to make things like this a separate event. I actually often make them scripts, but for this game it won't matter, and you will learn about that later. So calm down. We're gonna do our fire fire code. By fire code, it's just it's fire code. So here, let's have our player input because we need to fire. We're going to do a key space, and we're going to do a uh, key down because in or a key up, no down because in a lot of the versions of space invaders that I've played, you can fire with either space or down. So we're just going to do both. So keyboard check. Virtual keyboard space. Nice. Copy this, paste this. Now we're gonna do one for down. And change the name over here to down. Good. Now we need to fire the laser. If key underscore space or key underscore down logical or. This means if this is true or if this is true, either one, we can run our code. So we want to check if both of those are true and we want to check if we are alive. So, and alive. Now, this will not read as correct. Well, this, this may give you some odd errors here because it's checking two different conditions, but it won't know when to check them 
So parentheses matter. It's a lot like math because it's just math. So we want to check this first, so it's in parentheses. We want to check if we are pressing left or right, and we want to make sure that we're live. You know what? I'm going to be, I'm going to be I have a bit of OCD when it comes to code. I actually prefer to check if we're alive first. I know it doesn't make a difference, but to me it does, so we're doing that. So if we are live and if we are trying to shoot, now we can shoot. So let's instance, we need to create an event, or create the object of the laser. So we're going to start it at the character's X position. If you look down here, it'll specify what the parameters are asking for. We're going to carry, uh, create at the, uh, the Y position, so the X and Y of our laser will be the same as the player. And we're trying to create object underscore laser. Now we didn't create the laser object on purpose. I wanted to show you that this object is white, meaning that GameMaker doesn't, rec uh, doesn't acknowledge it, doesn't really understand what it is. And yeah, it would give us an error right now if we tried to shoot. So we're going to come down to objects. We're going to create an object, and we're going to call it object laser. Aha, it's with an S in America. So creating an object laser, giving it the sprite of object laser, and I just want to make sure that I haven't screwed anything up. Good. So we're going to create the same thing. We need to have a create event for this. I three initiate variables. Oh. That's not even what I press. Initiate variables. I wasn't going to do that, but I, I should. Speed is equal to 10. That's the number that I found worked for me. And damage is equal to 1. Because this laser will have some damage. And it's actually not going to matter for most of the game. Step. We need something to happen every time that the frame runs. Or every time that the game is running every frame that the game is running because we need to control the laser. So we'll say fucking travel up. <laughs> I don't know. We just want the laser to travel up the screen. So with every frame we want to do y minus equals speed. I guess I could have set speed to a negative because x goes down upwards. So our every frame y equals y minus speed. So yeah, it should be relatively self-explanatory. Let's play this, and let's look back at this. This is now a red object. Game Maker knows it. We should be clear. So run our game. Moving side to side. Hitting down will shoot. Hitting up will shoot. Now, notice that if I were holding the button or holding space, either way, it's just shooting infinitely. And that is not how Space Invaders works. There is a delay. If you play the game enough, you'll notice that you can only shoot when there's no other laser in the map. So we gotta make it react that way. We gotta make this game feel a lot like Space Invaders. So what we need to do is we need to create a condition for when we can fire. Like we already have a few conditions. We have to be alive and we have to be pressing one of the space buttons. But we need something else to be understood. We need to know that there's no other laser on the map. So if we can check for object underscore exists. This is another uh, function from GameMaker. And it's going to check if we have an object, object underscore laser. Now right now, it is checking if an object exists. Let's indent this, because that's how it's supposed to be. And if there is a laser on the map, it is going to return true. Now, if you put an exclamation point in the beginning, it will reverse whatever this output is. So now, if there is no object laser on the map, it will return false. So no, if there's no object, it'll return true, allowing us to shoot another one. But something we need to keep in mind is the uh, the laser is traveling up the screen and then it goes off the screen. Once it goes off the screen, it's actually still an object. Game Maker can still see it. So there's a really simple way to do this. If we go down to an event, an other event outside of room. So if the laser is ever outside of the room, we can just call instance underscore destroy. Super easy and super efficient. So now that's gone, we can fire again. Ah, oh, I'm sorry. Object exists. Exists is not what I wanted. We wanted instance exists. I make that mistake quite a bit. If you caught on to that first, I apologize. So instance exists, we can shoot. Now I'm holding the button, and we're only shooting once 
the laser reaches the top of the screen. If I try to spam the button or spam the space, either way, same read. We can only shoot when another laser is gone. Bang. Yeah. And bang, we have a player, we have a laser. But we're not going to finish here. Let's add a little bit more. We want, um, we'll go with barricades. So in Space Invaders, there's always four barricades that either you or the enemies can destroy, and you can use them strategically as bunkers. So let's create those and destroy those. So we're going to go down to sprites. I actually like to create things into groups. So we're going to create a player group. Should have done this first, and I'm sorry that I didn't. So I'm going to add those to the player group. We're going to create a group and call it, um, we'll call it environment. I don't know why. That's what I want to call it. We're going to create a sprite. Load a sprite because we have all of them that we need already in this project. So sprites, environment. Now we have a main block. These are all split up in different ways. You will understand that in a bit. But we're going to highlight all of them, 0 through 4, and open those up. Now if we go to edit sprite, you'll actually see that we have a deteriorating block. Or So I tried to draw it to look as such. So yeah, we have sprites. You can show the preview. It just breaks apart. We're good. We're going to call this Sprite Barricade 1. Just how I like to call it. I'm going to center this, hit enter, and move on. Good. So let's see. What do I need next? Now I need to create an object. We're going to do the same thing with groups over here. Create the player groups. We're going to create a group. Oh, that's an object. Object underscore barricade. Uh, I'm pretty sure I know how to spell barricade, but if that's wrong, I'm, I'll, I'll be embarrassed and it'll be right. So. so object barricade inside of our group that I forgot called environment. Good. Now this, this barricade is going to have a little bit of code. We're going to give this a create event. We're going to come down to our bit of code. Oops. I'm clicking on everything that I don't want to be clicking on. Okay. And we're going to initiate initiate variables. And there's only two things we're gonna need. This object needs to have a max HP, which we will give it four. Oh that's a one. And we're gonna have an HP, which is equal to max HP. Remember that this create event will only run once when the object is created. So now we're going to need a step event. Um, yeah, step. Over here we have. All right. So how do I explain this? So we have. I'm actually surprised that I don't need to change my image speed. Did I need to do that? This is not for you guys. This is for me. I didn't need to, and that's cool. So we have one barricade block, and it had five images inside of it. So it was full, solid, and then it was getting weaker and weaker. So we can actually access that variable. We can call upon the image uh, index, which is red. So it's a variable the game maker knows. And this is which frame or which sub-image of our sprite we are on. So an easy way to do this is if we set this equal to max HP minus HP, then right now, as we're at full health, max HP is 5, HP is 5, or 4, HP is 4, we're at image index 0. So if we come back to our sprite, image 0 is solid. So every time that we take a hit, our health is going to go down by 1, so then 4 minus 3 is 1, 4 minus 2 is 2, and you're going to look through all of those animations. I'm sorry, I didn't, didn't title this one. We'll just say life of a box. I don't, I don't care. The variable comments, they don't matter. They're, they're simply for you, but having something to remind you is nice. So now, if HP is less than or equal to, because we don't want it, just for some reason, you'll find bugs in code where you hit it with a 1. For some reason, it jumped from like 1 to negative 0.0. I don't know. This less than or equal to, a little bit safer, 0. And we're going to, I'll use curly braces this time. It doesn't matter. If you're doing a single line of code, you don't need braces. If you're doing multiple lines of code, then you do. And we'll call that same instance underscore destroy. So we have a box. 
we have a laser, we have a player. Now the box, this seems to be like some, I don't know what I'm trying to say exactly. It seems that this would work. The box has health, the box knows that if its health is zero, then it's destroyed. But the laser doesn't actually identify this barricade yet. It doesn't know what it is. So we're gonna come down here and grab an event, collision event, with environment, with barricade. We're gonna run a little bit of code. Collide with barricade. And we just need to tell the laser what to happen. The last thing we need to know is the laser has to be destroyed. So we can call instance destroy. But we know that that needs to happen at the end because if not, then the code might terminate before it actually finishes the rest of the code. Let me go back to my laser really quick. I don't want to forget anything. Okay. So now we have a few options in how collisions work. We could call that object barricade whoops, um, dot HP minus minus, which is the same as saying dot HP equals uh, dot HP minus one. But that would kind of destroy all of the barricades on the map. So we only want the one that we're colliding with, and GameMaker makes that pretty easy. You can call on other. So other.hp, so the other object in play here, minus minus. So other HP goes down by one every time we get hit. We could do um, minus equals damage, and that actually makes a little more sense because this laser only has a damage of one. We really didn't need that variable but it's good to use for consistency. So HP minus equals damage. There we go. And again, we would almost think we're done, but you'd be wrong because the barricade's not actually in the map. So let's come down here to our map, object, environment, barricade, and let's build a couple barricades. Let's also change this to a 16 by 16 grid so we can actually build, oh shitty. How big is the barricade? Uh, 12 by 12. Yeah, so let's do this. A 12 by 12 grid. And now we can actually... Why aren't, why aren't you doing this? There we go. Build a barricade. One, two, one, two, three. Okay. So we have a barricade. And I don't know how to space these out exactly right now. It doesn't really matter though. Uh, there will be four in this map. These are in the worst places. This one needs to come back. There we go. And right here. So we're not going to care too much about these. At least not yet. We'll clean them up in a sec. So we have four barricades. And let's see if they work. If I didn't screw this up again, then we have barricades that each block that I place, when you shoot, well, good. It goes down by one health tops down to nothing and breaks. We're actually not utilizing the last frame, but that's because I gave it four health instead of five, and there are five frames. So yeah, as you can see, you can actually shoot fast going through the barricades, because that's how the, uh, the lasers work. Once there's no laser on the map, the next one can shoot. So let's change that super quick. Let's give this barricade, uh, oops, create event. Let's give this five. What the hell? Oh, I'm not on a barricade. Let's give the barricade five health so we can use all of the frames. And let's clean up how they look a little bit. It's also at the same time learning about parents and inheriting variables or inheritance in inheritance in programming. Um, so we're gonna create another barricade object. Uh, object underscore barricade and we will do call this outside. It'll make a little more sense outside. No, we're going to call this outside. Now, the corners of our barricade, we want them to look rounded. It just looks a little bit better. So what this object will be is a new sprite that we'll import in just a second, and it needs to respond the exact same way that a barricade does. So we're just going to come down to parent, click environment, barricade, and all of that code is done. We can do this one more time, and even duplicate the object. Call it object, barricade, inside. And it's already set up as a parent because we duplicated. And let's come to our environment here. We're going to add those sprites. So load a sprite. This is an outside curve, a convex uh, curve. So these are the ones that we want. Import all of those. 
center it. And I'll actually show you. Ah, that one doesn't matter. Oh, oh, my bad, my bad. Sprite barricade to this. These don't matter as much because you're not going to read them. Centered and good. Alright. Create a sprite. Sprite barricade 3. Load sprite. And this last one will be the remaining concave sprites. Center them. Barricade 3. And one thing that we're going to change for this is since it's so small, like it's building that whole box, and if a laser were to shoot anywhere in that box, it would destroy that corner. So it would make the lasers kind of disappear before hitting them. So we're going to change that by going to Modify Mask. See, Automatic fills everything. Full Image fills everything. Manual is what we want. We want to raise the bottom up to about halfway. So bring it to about 6. Or even 4. Nah, now nah, we'll go 6. It just makes it look a little bit better. And it's a nice timing to learn how collisions kind of work. So come on back to this object. Give it the outside, come on to this object, give it the inside, go into our level, and you can delete uh, objects in the in the game window by holding control and right clicking. So we're going to get rid of oops, our outside pieces, let me actually put that one back. We're getting rid of our outward pieces. Again, um, I don't know if I mentioned before, but holding space and left click allows you to move, or just holding mouse middle click allows you to move. Good. So come down to environment, come to the outside, we're going to place one here, and place one here. This one's backwards, so we're going to come down to the X scale, reverse it, and we're good. So again, place one here, place one here, reverse it, place one here, place one here, reverse it, place one here, place one here, and reverse it. That already looks a lot better. Now let's do the same thing with the inside. Barricade inside, and then we place one here, and place one here, just like the top, we'll reverse it, place one here, place one here, reverse it, it's starting to feel like a song, place one here, place one here, reverse it, place one here, place one here, reverse it, good, and that's all that we need, press play, jump into our game, and crossing the fingers. Good, so we have four barricades. We can shoot them, they break. There are side pieces, top pieces, inside, oops, inside curves. Uh, we are not hitting them inside curves. Ah, we are, we are. I don't know why it's going through it. That's, that's not exactly what I want to see. It does work, just a little bit wrong. So let's try making that collision box a little bit bigger. I have a feeling that that might be the case. Well, actually, we'll set this one up to full image. Why not? So bar three, modify. Um, oh man, I really didn't want to have to change this. Go back to 11. Let's just see if that's gonna help at all. If it worked in the other game, I might fix that up and then I'll just come back later in the next part and touch it up again. So it shoots, yeah, that works a lot better. Yeah, see, it, it, the laser kind of dies out before it finishes and that's just gonna happen. So it takes five shots to break the barrier. I think actual Space Invaders was four, but I drew too many sprites. So you can change things like that. Like with the clone it doesn't matter that much. That's just I could I could remove a sprite and we're good. And there we have it for now. We have a playable character that can move and well he can move across the board and he can shoot lasers. We have barricades that are set up that can uh, be destroyed in a similar manner to Space Invaders. And we have the collisions to work with everything there. So it's a good place to stop. Next time we're gonna add in the enemy objects. Part of the code gets actually a little bit more complex. And we'll tackle all that. And then I think for the third part, we'll just clean up the, the GUI interface, kind of put in like a score count. And I should just finish this in three parts. Second part will probably be the longest. Hopefully I get better at not making mistakes along the way. And yeah, I hope you guys are enjoying this so far. So thank you so much for watching part one of this tutorial. I hope you guys like this enough to leave a like, a comment, or a subscribe if you haven't already. And I hope you're looking forward to the next parts. If you have any idea of what game you would like to see made, 
put a comment down below. What would you like to learn how to make? What would you like to see me make? As I said before, all the games I make I will do first on Twitch, where you can just watch the bulk of the code live, and then it will clean up the code and come here and make this tutorial. Hopefully I get better at that, so I don't make as many typos mid-tutorial. Again, thank you guys so much for watching. I hope this has helped. Have a nice day.